we spent quite a bit of time talking about the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, and for good reason. But there are plenty of endocrine glands and endocrine tissues that do not get their marching orders from the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. Uh, you can think of these guys as like uh, entrepreneurs. They are in charge of their own uh, hormone release. Uh, they decide for themselves, do I need more to make more of this hormone? Is now the time to release it? And they include, I included in that list here, I included the posterior pituitary gland. I, I didn't know quite where to put the posterior pituitary gland because the posterior pituitary gland is not controlled by the anterior pituitary, but it is controlled by the hypothalamus. Anyway, whatever, we've already talked about that one. Now we're going to talk about the pancreas because sugar diabetes, and then we'll talk briefly about the parathyroid glands and the pineal glands. We're not going to say too much about those guys. All right, diabetes. First of all, there actually are two kinds, two entirely different kinds of diabetes. Um, and let me just mention that to you. Uh, by the way, if, if anyone that you know says, hey, my doctor thinks I have diabetes, or hey, I think I just got diagnosed with diabetes, they're talking about sugar diabetes. And sugar diabetes, oops, sorry, my finger, <laughs> is technically called diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus was an ailment first, uh, I guess, discovered or pinpointed by um, ancient Greek physicians. And uh, diabetes basically means, wow, that guy pees a lot. And the word mellitus means like honey. So this is uh, just describing the situation that with sugar diabetes, people create very large volumes of urine. They will get dehydrated if they don't drink a ton and their urine tastes sweet. Now, the other kind of diabetes is diabetes insipidus. And as you can tell by the word insipidus, that's the derivation of insipid, Diabetes insipidus, that is lots of urine, but it doesn't taste like anything. It's insipid. And this is actually a problem with antidiuretic hormone, right? You do not need to know about this uh, for um, the exam, but someday you probably will need to know it, okay? One last thing. With diabetes mellitus, there are two kinds of diabetes mellitus, and it is type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes are both types of diabetes mellitus, okay? So there's two entirely different kinds of diabetes, but when you're talking about diabetes mellitus, there are two major types. There's a third one that we're not going to talk about. Okay, diabetes. Now, the, the organ that controls the amount of sugar in your bloodstream is the pancreas, and more specifically, the part of your pancreas called the pancreatic islets. The pancreatic islets, do I have a picture? Oh, yes, here. I just love these things. Okay, so this is uh, pancreas through the microscope. Um, this might be a mouse's entire pancreas, so not enlarged very much. And when you look here, you can see areas, I'm gonna circle them. Do you see areas like that, that look lighter than normal? Well, someone noticed that a long time ago and they got called, it was Professor Langerhans who called them the islets of Langerhans, or we just call them now pancreatic islets very often. Out of all of this pancreas that we're looking at, like what is it, like 95% of it is dedicated towards making digestive enzymes. We will talk about that when we get to the digestive system. And there's just a small part of it that are known as the pancreatic islets. And these pancreatic islets are the parts that have cells that make either glucagon or insulin. There are actually three kinds of cells. We're just going to talk about the alpha islet cells. Alpha also looks like that. The alpha islet cells, they make a hormone called glucagon. And the beta islet cells, 
they make the hormone insulin, right? When glucagon is around, it will cause your blood sugar to go up. Now, glucagon's job is not to make your blood sugar higher than normal. So let's make a little graph. Here's my blood sugar, kind of goes up and down during the day, right? And if my blood sugar level starts to get a little bit low, that will cause glucagon to be released and it's glucagon that will make my blood sugar go back up into the normal range, right? Um, if my blood sugar gets a little bit towards the high end, that will cause insulin to be released and that'll bring it back down into the normal range. So all the time, glucagon and insulin are just keeping your blood sugar right in that homeostatic zone. And here's our pancreas, the pancreas, is attached to the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. This would be the beginning of the stomach. The stomach actually covers the pancreas from the anterior view. And this is a, an image of the islets of Langer Hans, or you can see a real pancreas here um, with those islets of Langer Hans. If we zoom in real close, we'll see that the parts of the pancreas that are making digestive enzymes they take up the stain for the microscope very vividly, whereas the parts that don't take up the stain very well, those are the islets, and they're the ones that make glucagon and insulin. So the pancreas. Now, 98% the, oh, of the pancreas makes digestive enzymes. I was going to say that, and then it seemed like too much. Okay. So there's only a very small part of the pancreas that are the pancreatic islets, and insulin is made by beta islet cells. You need to know that for the exam. Glucagon is made from alpha islet cells. You need to know that for the exam. So because insulin makes blood sugar go down, then it only makes sense that it gets released when blood sugar is too high. And those beta islet cells they actually have a way of measuring, hey, blood sugar levels are going too high, I'm going to release insulin. Like I said, these guys that we're talking about now, these glands, they are independent contractors. They make these decisions for themselves. When insulin is around, it will work in a way that you will need to know, but the way it makes blood sugar go down is by uh, instructing all of the cells to bring glucose inside, okay? So when your blood sugar is high, insulin goes to all of your cells and say, hey guys, um, we just ate. Why don't you let the glucose in? And the, glu the cells all go, oh, okay. And they put doors in their membrane that let the glucose come in. So the important part of sugar diabetes and the role of insulin is not just that it keeps your blood sugar from being high, that does have an effect. Its biggest role is in getting glucose into your hungry cells. Without insulin, your cells don't absorb glucose. And as a matter of fact, without insulin, your cells also don't absorb amino acids. And if your muscle cells can't absorb amino acids, your muscle cells can't make muscle proteins, and your muscles go away. So people with sugar diabetes have high blood sugar and they will also end up losing their muscle of their body. They get to be skinny fat people, well, depending on which type of diabetes you have, right? So insulin stimulates protein synthesis and insulin is considered an anabolic hormone, anabolic, because it actually um, stimulates the growth of muscle by stimulating the synthesis of proteins and the uptake of amino acids to build those proteins. It also stimulates your liver to make glycogen. Glycogen, glucagon, not the same things, right? Glycogen, that is the starch that your liver and muscles makes when there's lots of glucose around. When you just ate a meal, and there's lots of glucose in your bloodstream, uh, uh, insulin shows up, says, hey, let's tuck a bunch of it in our cells and says, hey, liver, hey, muscles. You know, we seem to have a lot of glucose around here. How about tucking some of it away for a rainy day, okay? 
a rainy day, a few hours after a meal, when your blood sugar starts to go down, that glycogen will serve as a source to keep your blood sugar from going too low. Insulin also antagonizes glucagon, which means it's the, it's the opposite of glucagon, right? What does glucagon do? It comes from the alpha cells, and when blood sugar levels are too low, it will stimulate your liver and your uh, muscle cells to break apart the glycogen into individual glucose molecules to release that into the bloodstream so that your blood levels of glucose can go back up. When we say glucagon causes your blood glucose to go up, it makes sense that it would be released when your blood glucose is too low and it causes your blood glucose to go up because that glycogen that it stored away earlier, that glycogen um, is going to uh, be cut apart into individual glucose molecule. It also will stimulate the fat reserves in your body to release free fatty acids because many cells of your body their mitochondria, like muscle cells, their mitochondria can use free fatty acids for energy when glucose levels are low. All right, so hormones of the pancreas regulate blood glucose, and here's how it normally works. First, you eat something. Now, if whatever you ate has any carbohydrate in it at all, like let's say, let's say you ate something, let's say you had a piece of dry toast for breakfast. Um, you didn't eat any sugar, but you did eat starch, and the starch will get cut apart in your digestive tract into sugar molecules, and sugar goes into your bloodstream. Your pancreas notices the rise in blood sugar, which cells, the beta islet cells, will notice the increase in blood sugar. And those beta islet cells will secrete the insulin, they release it into the bloodstream, and insulin will tell your cells, hey, we got sugar out here. How about opening a door so the sugar can get inside? The cells go uh, get their glucose and they're happy. Yum. Your blood sugar goes back down into a normal range. Yay. Then when you use up your blood sugar and your blood sugar is starting to be low, insulin goes away and glucagon gets released. When glucagon gets released, it's going to tell your liver, hey, remember that glycogen that you made when we had too much glucose around? Mm, we ran out of glucose, we need our glucose back. And then the liver will cut apart the glycogen it just made and release glucose into the bloodstream and sugar goes back in your bloodstream. How many times a day does this happen? Every time you eat something, you get the insulin surge and then the Sugar goes away, and then you get the glucagon, and then you eat something, etc. Right? So, the pancreas and glucose homeostasis. Let's talk about sugar diabetes. I already told you that sugar diabetes is properly known as diabetes mellitus. It's sometimes abbreviated DM, diabetes mellitus. And diabetes mellitus comes in two types. It is either not enough insulin, which is type one diabetes, or you've got plenty of insulin at the beginning, too much insulin, but it's not working. And that is type two diabetes, okay? Type one diabetes, type two diabetes. Oh, this is actually an exam question. Um, what are the symptoms of diabetes mellitus? The symptoms of diabetes mellitus are too much urine, and too, too much is hyper, but when we're talking about some things, uh, we're, we call it poly. Um, so polyuria is urinating a large volume. Because people with diabetes mellitus produce too much urine, their body loses too much water, and that makes them very thirsty, very thirsty. Um, also, people with sugar diabetes, the reason that their urine tastes like honey is because they're losing sugar into the urine. And that means that people with sugar diabetes will be very, very hungry, particular, particularly with type 1 diabetes, particularly. 
And people with type 1 diabetes will also lose weight. Oh, but one more thing. Hyperglycemia. High blood sugar levels. Hyper, too much. Glyce, glucose. Emia, in the blood. Too much glucose in the blood. Hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia is found in both kinds of sugar diabetes. All right, we'll pick up our discussion of sugar diabetes in the next video.